hello ma'am so much uh, it's always been a pleasure to uh, interact with uh, you know academia and also uh, young uh, you know students uh, reading or studying cyber law and uh, the subject is such it's very dynamic uh, every day there's something new to learn so um, i'm here to share with you uh, experiences in this field basically there's so a lot to cover but uh, in a nutshell i'd like to just focus on a couple of areas which are uh, of keen interest today uh, the number one uh, you know uh, is the basic uh, artificial intelligence uh, how we see it and how, how we are being actually using this now in the uh, legal profession and even otherwise the health sector or you know different industry verticals so uh, before i even begin with these topics i think it's very important for us to understand that uh, information technology uh, as we see now is really changed from what was 20 years ago or 22 years ago and when the it act itself was enacted you know uh, in year 2000 uh, the the things were very different at that particular point of time we were just beginning to use e-governance and we were just beginning to uh, you know understand data and you know collation of data and uh, how we want to handle it and uh, we were focusing on electronic signatures you know specifically digital signatures and how uh, you know uh, various offenses were uh, put in under the IT Act. They were primarily to do with hacking and, you know, use of any uh, creation of any videos or audios and circulation of the same on, on social media or otherwise. And we hadn't really seen much of social media boom, you know, at that particular point of time. And now uh, things are obviously very different. Uh, technology runs businesses and, you know, without technology, we are really, uh, you know, one feels helpless because it's something that is uh, become, uh, you know, part and parcel of our daily lives, uh, not only for communication, personal communications, but socially and also from business point of view. So, um, so as I was sharing, you know, the IT Act, when it started, uh, you know, when it was actually enacted, uh, this whole gamut of uh, logistics and how the framework or legal framework would function, how the technology would evolve with time was probably not even envisaged at that particular point of time. We're today talking about uh, AI and we're today talking about uh, metaverse and you know NFTs. Uh, is, is so much has changed in the last 2022 years. So um, the main legislation as we understand is the IT Act and uh, with that there have been various laws you know like rules which have passed you know under that IT Act and the latest one uh, you would have seen is the uh, the, for the intermediaries, you know, the 2021 rules, media ethic rules. And besides that, there were other uh, rules which were formulated, you know, uh, there were major amendments in 2008 and uh, thereafter in, uh, you know, rules which were formed for blocking and intermediary rules, 2009, 2011, data protection rules, you know, those, those have been there, um, you know, evolving at various stages uh, you know of this whole uh, uh, like last few or two decades so um, when we started off with the it act it had very basic um, you know offenses like i was talking about hacking and then the publication of any obscene materials uh, it did not have at that particular time uh, you know the section on cyber terrorism and various sections of 354 a b c d you know, those were put in another, under the IPC, you know, which talk about cyber stalking and video barbarism or harassment to a woman. Uh, so all those sections which, you know, actually got added later on. And uh, the earlier sections uh, didn't have many, you know, provisions at that particular point of time. So it was uh, just very basic uh, sections under the offenses. But as the time went by, uh, we had new issues emerging on the cyberspace, like, you know, fake news is one, and uh, there have been various uh, hybrid versions of cyber crimes, like phishing, uh, financial crime, where you would get a, you know, fake letter, for example, or email from somebody, and, uh, or an SMS, or uh, even a voice message, uh, basically uh, trying to extract personal financial information from some user, and then they would commit uh, a data like a uh, you know theft, and uh, after that, either they could be hijack of the entire 
um, you know your system and uh, it could be a ransomware attack or in case of phishing it is generally uh, the financial fraud so the debit card or credit card details or net banking details would be compromised and that is through a social generating technique or use of so, you know technical tools or software which uh, spoof a person's identity it hides a person's identity and uh, a lot of criminals use vpns these days and they try to camouflage their real identity and then uh, you know they like to uh, commit these crimes so that there is anonymity in cyberspace and they may not be caught but um, nevertheless uh, since i have been a trainer to the law enforcement authorities we have used tools in the past and i've also researched lately on a tool called asma where uh, you know if if an accused is on uh, on bail for example or if there is a suspect who is making false identity accounts in social media can be tracked you know so where what post is he making what account is he using uh, from which uh, place is he you know basically posting the same which device is he using all those things can be tracked using this uh, tool and it will also send an email alert to uh, you know the police in case they want to do the surveillance online surveillance on such a suspect or an accused so these are the advances we've seen you know lately um, and the whole criminal jurisprudence is changing in the country with uh, new databases of accused you know there's a there's this new criminal procedure bill uh, which is being passed so uh, you know there are new uh, new insists you know to this field and new laws which are going to be operable the fingerprints the biometrical data would be taken off the accused uh, you know and kept with uh, the ncrb and those are very interesting developments but what we have to watch out for uh, obviously is that how good we are at protecting data as well and that has been uh, the center stage of a lot of debate in the last few years um, you know the pdp bill which is pending the personal data protection bill and uh, the justice shri krishna committee report uh, tabled a particular uh, you know bill and then this was looked into by the joint parliamentary committee and then we are in the midst of having you know a, a very soon personal data protection act in the country so we're looking forward to it and along with it came a lot of debates of delocalization localization of data what is sensitive personal information the entire definition of sensitive personal information is changing you'll be surprised to know but uh, the sensitive data is uh, you know the current pdb bill doesn't have password as a sensitive data there it it has new things like uh, your uh, uh, orientation, religious orientation, your um, biometrical is definitely a part of sensitive data, health, health records, but your political views or your social and religious preferences, well, a person's sexual orientation, everything, uh, these are certain new uh, you know, things which you will see in the PDP. And uh, there, that is an interesting uh, you know, development, how the country will be using those laws to actually you know, um, protect people's data. And uh, with the Justice uh, Shri Krishna Committee report and uh, you know, the K.S. Puttaswami case, right to privacy has been upheld. And then that is something which is fundamental under Article 21 of the Constitution of India. And with that landmark judgment, a lot has uh, changed in the country. We are seeing new uh, right to be forgotten cases based on this uh, this right. And there are conflicting decisions at this point uh, because not in every case can one uh, seek this right to be forgotten. Um, it really depends whether uh, you know a person's private interest is, is more important than a public interest, which it may be in a particular given situation. So not all cases which use uh, you know the uh, petitioner's name can be actually uh, pulled out from the libraries by saying or judgments by saying that you know claiming that this is a right to be forgotten and they should be pulled out from the libraries. So that that may not be the case really, but in justifiable circumstances, this might be allowed. So, uh, in my view, uh, the Article 21 should protect, you know, automatically the right to be forgotten. It doesn't need a statutory stamp for uh, the same uh, in view of this judgment of Justice K.S. Puttaswamy case. That's my interpretation, but uh, subject to, obviously, everybody has personal views on the subject. But that's my view. 
and um, I, I seriously feel that a lot um, of dynamics at this particular point of time we are seeing uh, with the use of AI and blockchain and you know new concepts coming in into play uh, e-courts is a huge uh, a leapfrog from what we used to see in terms of access to justice system in the country. So uh, when I say that, um, I've been part of the e-filing project, the e-courts mission project, where uh, the Supreme Court of India, uh, you know, they created an e-filing manual also uh, that was authored by myself. Uh, the uh, Honorable E-Committee members uh, actually worked on this e-committee, uh, you know, e-mission e project where e-filing uh, through any nook and corner like district level is possible through online means and uh, the litigant has that access to justice you know system through that software which is operable uh, and available for use in across 21 high courts and more than 10,000 district courts in india so that has been a big achievement in the, in the judicial system which we uh, have been seen change with time and uh, we are looking forward to more electronic evidence being used in, in most of our litigation cases here. Uh, so this needs and this really requires a harmonized law framework, which which is also underway. So something that uh, will, uh, I think, solve a lot of issues which are currently there because a lot of evidence which we are holding at this moment uh, would come through, you know, electronic means and how one has to produce, how one has to preserve, that is also important. You also would uh, appreciate, you know, there are e, I would say, courts which have robots in, in them. In Supreme Court of India also, uh, traffic chalan cases are being resolved through such means. And that's not something which is a myth, it's, it's reality. And a lot of court work gets done through, uh, in, especially in Delhi High Court. Uh, and Supreme Court uh, through digital means. So we are seeing a lot of change you know, with the AI deployment uh, in the judicial system, in the uh, legal frameworks and the legal you know, access to justice systems in the country. Apart from that, there are various uh, industries which are benefited with this AI, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, like you would see the healthcare, um, it's uh, telemedicine has gone a big way uh, how you know this uh, AI can benefit the patients across uh, the globe, and um, in in automation, in uh, automobile industry, um, and uh, you know collation of data, IT industry itself, uh, and manufacturing sector, they are all being benefited through this uh, humongous amount of volumes of data which are being created and you know on the internet and how. Uh, through a click of a e library search, you know, we are able to find uh, across so many cases um, what is uh, the most relevant case with a simple keyword. And uh, the AI also assists, you know, in uh, checking uh, overruled cases and other, you know, databases. And AI has really, uh, I would say, expedited the way in which we function in terms of legal profession as well. So e-research or e-libraries uh, looking after international commercial arbitrations, where we have huge amounts of paperwork, uh, can be easily you know, uh, done through AI-based uh, softwares. So if we want a particular document, it's easy to retrieve that document from lots of volumes of data with just a click of a, uh, you know, a date or a particular keyword search. And that can really overturn the whole case out. So it's very, very uh, useful as a tool. You know, AI and um, blockchain, uh, we see that used a, a lot in cryptocurrency. And that itself has been a huge debate whether cryptocurrency is legal or illegal. RBI had given various guidelines on the same. And uh, at, at one point of time, it was, uh, you know, a gray area and it still is in some ways because we are not sure whether it is completely banned or not in India. But uh, from whatever we have read so far and seen so far, it appears to me that it's very regulated rather than banned in India as well. So that's something uh, which is again in the pipeline and let us see how things uh, proceed from there. So this uh, gives a whole paradigm of how this uh, cyber law is shaping in the country. But uh, besides this, we very, very you know latest subjects of being you know metaverse and NFTs, and here an IP uh, intellectual property can be a picture, it can be a film, 
how that uh, copyright can be you know bought online uh, with just payment of bitcoins or other other cryptocurrency and uh, one can actually own a, 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 a say image of an island or a logo or a particular ip you know a music file or a basic film you know um, a short snippet with these nfts so and they are all ledger based so something like blockchain which will protect uh, who the owner is and you know it will give the ownership rights so that's why it's very exciting and very interesting for a lot of uh, young you know, people who are on the net uh, looking looking for that and metaverse uh, also you know use of virtual reality and how uh, various programs and various events are also being held on metaverse so that's amazing to see um, how the virtual and the real world have kind of merged merged in the sense that uh, we cannot segregate the two anymore in, in a lot of ways. So uh, a lot of people's personalities, a lot of identity is linked with the internet identity. And initially when we used to talk about avatars and things, uh, they used to be uh, disjuncted from the real landscape, but now the reality is somewhat infused with the virtual real, you know, reality. So uh, it's become a, a paradoxical situation when we say internet on internet, this is the a particular fact. But in reality, this is the fact. So it, you cannot actually segregate the two anymore to a lot of extent in many ways, including transactions and businesses. So, and that's evident from the fact that even electronic contracts are considered valid, legally valid in, you know, in India through the IP Act. So if, if you were to enter into a contract or sign a document online, perfectly valid as a document you want to print out an email and serve it produce it in a court of law as evidence it says again something which is admissible the only uh, conditions uh, are to you know be uh, basically fulfilled is uh, by the section 65b of the evidence act where you have to file an affidavit and say that this is authentic it's printed from your system give your device number and other details so uh, it's not uh, a lot of questions come to us about you know electronic evidence can we give uh, say a chat message or uh, what, can we produce this in evidence in the court uh, somebody's harassing or somebody's cyberbullying somebody's been stack stalking someone it's all possible it's all possible is what we say that but yes there's a way of, of producing a way of preserving and computer forensics is linked with this field because how we produce how we collect collect evidence and produce it in the court is there's a particular way of doing that so that's how uh, things are but overall if you see the paradigm uh, of cyber crimes it has increased many folds in the last few decades and especially you know crimes against women crimes against corporate identities crimes against children they have increased uh, uh, to a great extent and you may have been uh, you know maybe read about it somewhere but uh, cybercrime.gov.in is something uh, like a website official website where you can actually report crimes and a zero fir can also be lodged you know in urgent cases so uh, that's important for us to understand as well and uh, most of these crimes under cyber crimes they are uh, you know they have a punishment of up to three years uh, uh, imprisonment or fine or both but in certain cases like child pornography that that's five years or more so those uh, especially in young children if there's grooming or stalking boxo gets in you know attracted as well as a statute special law and there obviously there also we have provisions uh, you know to prohibit uh, any kind of uh, sexual harassment to a child and Again, child pornography is also prohibited. So there are punishments which are more than, uh, like it's uh, three years or uh, fine or more in sexual harassment. And in cases of child pornography, it's much more five years or more. So there is a lot of, uh, I would say, consistency in terms of uh, law, POXO and IT Act when it comes to children related offenses and IPC when we talk about women related offenses and IT Act. And in general, uh, in the corporate sector, there are crimes against property, for example, 
you uh, know uh, somebody's uh, like identity has been stolen is a crimes against person but somebody's data being stolen somebody's uh, device being hijacked or ransomware attacks those will fall under crimes against property and if uh, an assault is made uh, like an attack on uh, you know somebody's reputation defamation actions follow and in cases of uh, you know crimes against government like sedition attacks or other you know hate speech uh, something which uh, is amounting to cyber terrorism would actually fall under it act as well and that that's a very serious offense up to life imprisonment uh, is what is prescribed as a punishment there so um, having said that uh, i think it is important for me to also mention that it's not just it act only deals with cyber crimes there is a civil side to it as well so uh, in the case of uh, you know somebody's uh, spoiled somebody's data or access somebody's uh, uh, database illegally which is not with a mens rea not with a mental intention to commit crime but has somehow destroyed somebody's data or taken something uh, and causes a loss to that person can also sue the person under uh, civil law which is uh, the office of adjudicating authority and that adjudicating authority officer can give compensation to such a person you know and this uh, authority also grants compensation in cases where a body corporate like for example your telephone company or your broadband company has uh, you know misused the data which you have given a personal data and they or there has been a security breach in their system and they have not taken due diligence measures or they have shared it with somebody else uh, illegally you know so that's something uh, which has caused harm to the user he can obviously file for compensation there so that's also um, an interesting aspect which a lot of people uh, probably just overlook or don't don't really understand in terms of it act that it covers both civil uh, rights you know civil uh, you know side of it as well as the criminal side right then uh, one aspect which is also very important is the point of jurisdiction after all if there is a crime which is committed where where do we uh, file a complaint so obviously in such a case wherever the crime has been committed from is a place uh, you know that is a, has a jurisdiction but in civil cases especially in cases where a particular act has caused an uh, you know uh, affected an, another person like in defamation cases so in such cases crpc says and provides that in such cases the jurisdiction will be maintainable wherever the offense is committed from and where the effect of it is felt so in such cases you have jurisdiction at both levels and even uh, in cases of you would see copyright violations trademark violations such a provision exists that jurisdiction can be maintained at the place where uh, you know the uh, aggrieved party stays or works for gain so that's something uh, also interesting for us to uh, discuss here now having said that uh, one important aspect which we cannot uh, you know miss out uh, is the social media liability after all a lot of social media uh, activity is going on at this point and um, a lot of fake accounts are coming up um, many times we see that the intermediaries uh, are not taking due diligence measures maybe they don't have a privacy policy maybe they don't have a terms of use but more than that their grievance officers are not appointed in india and that has been uh, an aspect of debate also so um, of late we've seen certain new rules come up where uh, they have to act with more agility for example if there is something which is obscene in content and uh, you know it has to be blocked immediately one can write to the social media uh, you know officer the grievance officer and if that is not taken down in 24 hours time as per the new intermediary guidelines of 2021 the social media uh, company can be held liable in the courts of law and in such cases uh, i've often dealt with you know and handled these kind of cases where defamation is involved or right to be forgotten is involved or cyber crime has happened and uh, often the entities which are you know brought in as defendants are abroad they're not in india so are they answerable to indian courts is also another question so in such cases uh, we have 
had cooperation from a lot of uh, social media companies and otherwise uh, from certain email companies and um, registrars of websites which are based abroad. And in certain cases, they may even not submit to the jurisdiction of Indian courts. So it really depends on the facts of every case. But yes, we have succeeded in getting good orders where uh, blockings have happened and, uh, you know, certain websites have been suspended or blocked or you know, pages, relevant pages have been blocked from those websites and data theft cases, a lot of data theft cases where the data, uh, you know, it's been finally held that so and so has uh, is guilty of committing data theft and compensations have been awarded. So many of these cases where women have been victimized and then they have gone for legal recourse, uh, a lot of children in sextortion cases, those have also been, uh, you know, handled and uh, there are proper ways of going about it. Uh, depends on, again, facts of every case, both civil and criminal remedies could lie in such cases. And um, in one of the defamation cases, the person who was defamed was in India, but the company where the email was sent was in Japan. So questions arose on whether we can file a case here or a case in Japan. And going with the CRPC, you know, we could easily convince the uh, investigators that this case should be filed here because the person who is defamed is here in India. He's a one director of a very good multinational company. So one could easily, you know, file a criminal action here and get recourse. So those kind of questions emerge, you know, in many of these cases but uh, in the last uh, pandemic time you know a lot of ransomware has occurred and a lot of uh, cases of stalking and thirdly uh, a lot of cases of identity theft um, they have risen and fake news of obviously was uh, always there but man in the middle attacks have increased a lot um, i don't know if you know about man in the middle attacks but if there are two corporate companies uh, selling buying certain services or goods uh, a, a person who's maybe an insider or an employee he creates fake accounts and uh, exchanges mails in such a way that it goes unnoticed that they are corresponding with fake account uh, which is similar looking to the original account email account and invoice is uh, changed or morphed and once it's poached uh, wrong bank details are given and the person who is paying doesn't realize that it's going to a, ba a wrong bank account and the money just gets siphoned off. So those are man in the middle attacks and often involve more than one country. And, uh, we've had a chance to work on cross-border disputes as well and crimes. And uh, Interpol has been good uh, in terms of, you know, working on such cases and especially getting evidence from a broader extradition is a challenge still, you know, in India. And I'm hoping with the PDP bill, uh, we will see a lot of cooperation in terms of collection of evidence and even maybe extradition. And uh, hopefully we will see a lot of cases get solved um, more uh, quickly than what we do at this moment with the MLAT system. So with these words, I think uh, I'd like to take a couple of questions. Uh, it's uh, I'll leave some time for uh, discussing some real life cases or you know problems that you would like to talk about and that will make it uh, you know a wholesome uh, training session I think only uh, interaction can really uh, work well on a training level I, that's my experience and I'd like to take up some questions with me uh, would you like uh, to start uh, with the questions? Yes. Uh, Amu, I think uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat box you can read it out. Amu? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Just a moment. Ma'am, question from Sanjeev. Yes. Uh, why government is not taking effective measures, setups to protect the cyber crime with the help of artificial intelligence? Well, uh, government is working um, it's not that uh, the government is not working there are a lot of projects and um, you know we've been involved with a lot of work on this front um, whether it is law enforcement uh, you know machinery or otherwise tracking of uh, you know crimes and uh, criminals and investigations 
the ai has been uh, you know there have been draft proposals there have been also projects which are you know outlined as i said one example i gave you was of use of this tool asma you know this very interesting how uh, ai is helping people you know track criminals and it's interesting to see uh, national borders and frontiers could be protected using ai because cyber warfare is something which is a very very big concern across various countries you know across the globe and uh, only with the help of ai and other uh, emerging technologies we can we will be able to combat these issues you know in real life so uh, in real time you need to have ai in almost every aspect of what we are doing on the net today because there's humongous amount of you know data which needs to be filtered and right results have to be shown so that's applicable across all 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 fields of uh, i would say businesses including uh, the way government uh, you know basically has e governance and uh, administers the various laws which are there you know which are under its uh, supervision including it law so there have been projects and there are still some in the pipeline it's not that uh, it's not been implemented yes you can uh, continue with the other questions um, next question from arsha aras the question is nowadays a lot of cyber crimes are happening due to the negative issues of artificial intelligence technology but as of now we don't have a particular uh, particular regulatory framework to uh, regulate such things whether the current cyber laws are effective in this regard well i think uh, ai uh, it's it's something that we have to see how uh, it pans out but will probably need a separate legislation of its own uh, at this stage uh, whatever framework we have in the country uh there are definitely challenges uh, for example how the data has to be collated in the first place the questions of data ethics the questions of data science um those have to be streamlined and when we are collating data how we are collating it where we are so you know saving it how it has to be shared where it has to be stored how it has to be retrieved whether it has to be deleted or not those are again interlinked with data protection and you know rights of people so uh, that's very uh, important uh, that this ai develops in india alongside with uh, you know the deployment of ai has to be in the parameters of law so it cannot flout the law exactly so we, while we take the best uh, you know of particular technology or the benefits of the same it has to be within the confines of law so uh, we have to strengthen the law framework definitely uh, we do have a basic framework but yes we need to work on it there can be certainly many amendments to the it law they may be in the longer run need for a special legislation on ai i'm 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 quite uh, i won't be surprised if that happens or is being debated uh, already because that's something which i envisage also in the long run um next question from gogul balakrishnan who is the authority to issue a certified authority under section 65b iea for chats in whatsapp and how uh, how an victim can produce these chats as an useful evidence in court okay so i if someone wants to read more about this whole aspect there's a latest case of arjun pandit rao you know in supreme court of india has uh, clarified that uh, the affidavit which has to be given is by the chief technology officer of uh, a particular company or if it's a user then uh, he can you know certify or say on an affidavit that this has been printed from his system and these are the uh, details which are available and the machine is working fine so all these uh, you can give as a declaration and an affidavit but if somebody doesn't have uh, that data you know and that data is maybe with a server or service provider so uh, that has to be the 65b then has to be given by that service provider and not by the user and that can be you know in a particular litigation you can ask for or seek those orders from the court and then the court would grant that order and you know um, the service provider would be supplying that data which is called for 
and uh, for example user details or what chats were there in particular uh, you know, messaging and then also uh, apart from this the uh, 65b will be you know written you know, like a, an affidavit would be produced by the particular service provider so uh, this is uh, the current law and uh, if if the service provider declines then at least the user has tried his best and that's what the court will consider in you know, when the admissibility of evidence has been considered that is how the law is um, next question from prashanda kumar ma'am kindly highlight some of the artificial intelligence based cyber forensics tools which are acceptable in the court of law uh, i didn't get your question if you could repeat that the question kindly highlight some of the artificial intelligence based cyber forensics tools which are acceptable in the court of law okay so uh, there are various uh, you know cyber forensic tools which we use uh, for example if we've handled many cases where you know we have used various software tools uh, to cull out evidence you know in for example in data theft cases or uh, other you know uh, cases where we have to pull out a lot of data you know a lot of uh, legitimate uh, evidence from a particular uh, you know case so access data is one of them you know you can uh, see that a lot of terrorist attacks you know they are using tower data and other uh, information uh, they are trying to see the cdr you know and where a particular post has been made from where is the location gps all these details are uh, gathered you know using a lot of uh, sometimes even ai and uh, ai based software tools so uh, you can see uh, you know there are software tools like extero or others you know which help look at various data which is available on the net and then you could uh, you know pay you know use the same in a particular case asma as i said was one of them as well for surveillance it depends what is the object you know what is the objective of having a particular tool it may be ai driven but uh, functionality of every tool may be different so depends on which uh, you know what purpose you are going to use it for and then a tool can be looked into yeah ma'am uh, next question from ochiang Hmm. what are your comments on data protection in india especially it seems there is no specific law covering that even it act is having loopholes on the same it act does have sections on the same as as i said uh, section 43 43a which deals with contravention civil wrongs and uh, you know the right uh, to have the privacy policy for example you know should show what what is being collected should declare uh, what the purpose of the same is and you know what for how long will it be kept by the service provider these are all essentials which have to be mentioned in the privacy policy and the terms of use by an intermediary if they don't mention the same it is a breach of law so it's a violation so uh, it's important uh, to see that at least the basics uh, framework is there however if we need to strengthen it and uh, with the influx of so much data available today and the way the businesses are taking people's data and misusing it without their permission is been a concern and that is the reason why when it has become a mammoth exercise you know to make a ptp bill in india and uh, have a proper legislation uh, in itself like we were discussing ai should have a proper legislation of its own similarly uh, data protection today is already something that we are addressing by a separate legislation so uh, you know this is uh, something that I, i i wouldn't say that we don't have data protection provisions in india but they are very very skeletal and that's the re reason why we need a proper full fledged law in the country we are already working towards it um uh, next question from dr prince madam if zoom meet is not cooperating with the investigation of police in identity theft what can be done if uh, who is not cooperating zoom meeting zoom meet okay. zoom meet okay so if a particular service provider doesn't cooperate in a identity theft case 
then um, obviously uh, you know uh, it depends if if you filed a litigation uh, like is it a criminal case you're filing or if you're filing a civil action and usually uh, they are a party to as a necessary or a proper party to a particular case to give you evidence and uh, if they don't uh, give i mean despite the directions of the court if you have made them a party then they obviously uh, if a notice has been issued and they have been asked to provide the same they are supposed to do that and if they don't obviously there are liabilities for the same and uh, the law of the country will uh, prevail so whatever law you know we have in the country you go by that and in case uh, they cooperate then they usually give this data in a confidential envelope to the court that's how it is usually done and uh, these service providers are intermediaries under the current it law framework so there are liabilities for intermediaries who don't cooperate with law enforcement authorities including imprisonment so uh, they can be content of court once the court has issued an order as well so it depends on the facts of every case how uh, what will be the repercussion of not non cooperation in that case ma'am uh, next question from divya gayatri sorry divya ganapati ma'am your opinion on the impact of ai in our indian legal system and its attribution as in should it be regarded as a legal person uh, i couldn't follow your question can you repeat that please ma'am uh, ma your opinion on the impact of ai in our indian legal system and its attribution as in should it be regarded as a legal person yeah it's an interesting question i have actually dealt with that extensively in one of my books which i have authored it's on amazon books there's a separate book on ai which i have written and a couple of other topics you can read up uh, if you are more interested in that but yes there's a debate on this because uh, ai itself uh, can it be a person because a lot of work which gets uh, you know done on the net can be also automated so the question is does it have the intention you know it's making the act of maybe signing a contract for you on your behalf or your instruction but can we uh, impute criminal liability for instance you know on a machine or a particular way of uh, working with technology so and and if a particular uh, piece of work has been created with ai can it hold a copyright uh, those are some of the interesting questions uh, which are being debated across many countries i believe and also uh, india will soon look at this uh, more closely but uh, most of the legislations which you see in india when we talk about person uh, have different definitions of who of, you know they are being referred referred to and when we say person person can also be an individual it can be an entity it can be a trust it can be you know a body corporate uh, it it depends on uh, legislation to legislation and how uh, the definition of person would be you know pan out in in, in case of uh, you know, it act is also an interesting uh, aspect to be seen because uh, under the current uh, legislation we use body corporate as a term you know when they are collecting data from people so if a if a ai based server is for example or a computer is collecting data of people can we call this ai uh, as a body corporate or representing uh, an agent or authorized person of the body corporate is another question we haven't yet got answers to those they are academic questions which we still need to see apart from that uh, we use the term natural person you know when we talk about individual in in the it act so it's it's very uh, in, in it will be very interesting to see how you know the word person would be interpreted uh, you know in the current framework of law but uh, currently we don't have the definition of person really in in this uh, definition clause of it act so it does mention uh, you know 43 as i said the body corporate and you know natural person as reference to a individual so uh, with the new technologies which are emerging that's the reason i said amendments will be necessary because new questions of law will come about as the challenges grow the law needs to adapt itself or make amends uh, you know to its provisions uh, 
ma'am. Uh, next question from Sanjeev Kumar. Ma yes. Do you that in Bachelor of Engineering teaching the uh, technically artificial intelligence or cyber crime tools? I can't hear you. Uh, Bismi, can you repeat your question? Uh, ma'am, am I audible? Yes, now it is. Ma'am, um, do you think that in Bachelor of Engineering, engineering teaching hmm. the uh, technically artificial intelligence or uh, cyber crime tools? Yes, I think that's very relevant because uh, when we talk about engineering today, it's uh, uh, intrinsic when we talk about especially computer science related, uh, you know, computer related engineering. It's, it's something that uh, could be of, you know, importance and uh, it is something which can be explored. And a lot of universities have already, uh, you know, done some courses for IGNU and other uh, bodies where organizations, UGC, where uh, the curriculum has been revised to a great extent and uh, some short term some long term you know course modules have been infused which talk about cyber forensics which talk about cyber law and uh, even ai so there are specialized uh, modules which are being you know incorporated in syllabus uh, of engineering colleges as well so that's uh, i think the need of the hour because to keep pace with uh, the current times and to make it uh, relevant to what we are doing today it's important to keep changing the syllabus uh, based on the needs of the industry. Um, there is two more questions. Yes. Uh, questions from Anish Matthew. To mm -hmm. what extent AI will have effect on people? Effect on people. We are already being affected with AI. You know, uh, the every day, if you, if you, uh, like you would have seen, there's a lot of, uh, I would say invasion of privacy also happening with AI because now when you talk about uh, any, um, you know, whether it's an iPhone or if it's a usual Android phone, uh, whatever conversations you're having, the apps which you're using, they may be even snooping into what you're talking and tomorrow, you, you know, you can experiment this, but if you talk about a particular food item or if you talk about a particular book or a particular service or a travel, you will find ads on your phone or on your desktop. So uh, it's nothing uh, new, which is already a part of, you know, current lives. Uh, there is hardly any uh, privacy left on the internet, to, so, so to speak. And that is why we need this PDP bill and, you know, we need the better protection of law uh, because uh, the way AI is being used uh, by companies, um, they're collating information, they're uh, disseminating, you know, ads and running it for their financial agendas. And uh, it's important that individuals' privacy is protected, you know, data is protected and AI can uh, and has already, you know, invaded the people's privacy to a great extent. But it has, it's also on the other hand, a very, very big, uh, I would say, boon in many cases, especially when it comes to health records or data. AI has been, uh, you know, a very, very uh, instrumental in, you know, I would say curing a lot of problems of people and looking at papers and research papers uh, one can actually pull out the most relevant record of, of a particular case or a particular um, in the legal industry, for instance, and of a particular health record if needed in the telemedicine area. So uh, likewise, in, in combating cyber war, uh, combating uh, these problems of terrorism, AI is being used in a big way uh, to do surveillance and protect our borders. So I think on an individual level, as I said, privacy and data protection is a key concern. But uh, from the benefits of it, there are definitely a lot of benefits. And that is why we need to look at that and, you know, strengthen our frameworks uh, to protect our individual rights. Uh, I think that's the best way, we, way to proceed on this. Any other questions, Bismi? Because I have another meeting to catch on. Yes, yes. Hi, yes. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, Amu, you can go for the vote of thanks. Thank you so much, ma'am. Oh fighting some time so that uh, I'm sure all the participants have benefited from the uh, interaction. Amma, please, vote of thanks. Uh, Ma'am, we participants are uh, really thankful for you to uh, this kind informative section. So uh, from the part of uh, Department of Life Learning and all the, uh, from the bottom of heart of uh, all the participants, we thank you. Thankful 
for you, ma'am. Thank you so much, Bismi, and thank you uh, to the Mahatma Gandhi you know, University. It has been uh, a great uh, privilege and pleasure to be here and discuss uh, all these pertinent issues with all the audience and including academy and participants today. I look forward to more interactions, but if you have any, you know, just things that you'd like to uh, discuss further, you can feel free to send me questions on an email and um, most uh, happy to have you on our network. So anybody who wants to connect with me can uh, look at the cyber law, uh, you know, uh, as a channel. You have a YouTube channel as well on cyber law. It's called Cyber Law India. And uh, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn as well as Twitter or Instagram. Most welcome to remain updated with whatever is, uh, you know, the current uh, law. And the latest book which I've authored, as I said, was uh, Computers, Internet in New Technology Laws. And it has only been released this year. So you can read uh, a lot if you really want to know the depth of this, uh, you know, particular subject. Uh, that'll be a very helpful guide for you in case you'd like to read.